In this video, I'm going to go through answers to the exercises in part 021 exercises tables and find.m. Link to that document is in the video description. The idea is that uh, anybody watching these videos, whether officially my students or unofficially, would attempt all these problems on your own after watching the previous videos and then come here if you're stuck on anything or if you just want to see me work through some of the answers. All right, so the first question is just a short multiple choice here. If M is a matrix with five rows and seven columns, what are the dimensions of the transpose of M, which is the same as M apostrophe? Well, since the transpose is literally going to take all your rows and put them into columns, it's basically going to reverse your rows and columns. So if you got a five by seven, you're going to end up with a seven by five. So B is your correct answer here. Next question, write a line of code that reads data from thermocouples.dat into a variable named m using read matrix, then display the bottom right two by two corner of m. So there's a couple steps here. Thermocouples.dat, again, you can find a link to that in the video description. So let's go ahead and create a variable named m and set it equal to read matrix and then our file name. And let's just start with that. All right, it doesn't work, but that's because the file that I'm trying to open is not in my current folder right here. Now there's a couple ways for me to fix this. I know that the file that I'm looking for is actually in this files to read in subfolder. So one really easy fix is I just double click on that folder name and now my current folder is that uh, subfolder which has thermocouples.dat. And so if I go ahead and rerun this, and part of my problem is that I typoed the file name. It's not thermocouples.dat. M, but thermocouples.dat. Now I'm still going to get an error because this file is in the files to read in subfolder. Now there's at least three ways I can think of to fix this. One is that I could just write that folder name on the front of this file name so that it's on the path. Now I think as a Windows user I need a backslash. Let's try that out. Yes, that works. Okay, so backslash if you're a Windows user. I believe it would be a forward slash if you're on uh, an Apple machine. Now another thing that I could do is just get rid of that and just double click on the folder and that would also work. Right there it is again. And then a third thing that I could do is I could use the add path command. So let me get back out of that folder. And then I could say add path. And that would also work. All right, so I've got the data. It's not displaying very nicely. Uh, one little trick that you can use to display it out so that it fits on the screen is display and then table and then the matrix itself. That will not work in Octave because Octave does not have a table function, but otherwise all the code that I'm gonna show you does work in Octave exactly as it works in MATLAB. Okay, cool. So there's my matrix right there, but I just want the bottom right two by two. So I just want these values right there. So the way I can do that is I can, let's just display it out. Now I could count up how many rows there are, but there's this great functionality built into MATLAB and Octave, this end keyword. And I can say from end minus one through to end, comma, and that'll be my second to last row, basically the last row minus one through to the last row, and then a comma, and then the exact same thing for the columns. And it'll give me second to last column through to the last column. Let's go ahead and rerun it. And there are my values right there. Bottom right two by two of that matrix. Moving on down, times and temperatures. The following example is followed by a question for you to write code for at use min to determine. Okay, so some example code given, and then uh, you're gonna fill in stuff down here. Use min to determine the time at which the lowest temperature occurs. So I showed a lot of this code in uh, one of the videos recently, the previous videos. So revisit that if you need to. Basically, I've got a vector of times. I've got a random vector of temperatures. They're not really going to be temperature values. Also, in the other example, I used rand n, whereas here I just used rand. I displayed that stuff out with a table. This will not work in Octave, but basically everything that's not the table function in this file will work in Octave. And then I use this code right here to not only determine what is the highest temperature, but what is the position at which it occurs. And then I plug that position, that index value, into the times vector to determine at what time the highest temperature occurs. But what if we want to do pretty much the same thing with the minimum temperature? but the time at which that minimum temperature occurs. Well, from scratch, let's put it together. 
but we'll create a variable called min temp and the index at which it occurs. We'll set that equal to the min function of our temperature vector, which I actually don't remember. Did I just name it temperatures? There we go. So I will copy that down. But I want the time at which the minimum temperature occurs. So what I need to say is times parentheses index. I could say like row one column index, but I don't really need that since it's just a vector. I could just say index. So let's rerun this section. All right, so the temperature 0 0.0975, index six, that's the sixth position. And then what is that time? It's 17, it's hour 17 if we're on like a 24 hour uh, clock. You will get different results because of the randomness involved. Another way to find that time just all at once is to say times at what position at the same position as where the minimum temperatures equals or is equivalent to the values in the temperatures vector. It's a different number because of the randomness, but it's the same number uh, regardless of if you do it this way or if you do it this way. And for some reason, my formatting doesn't have the format compact. So I'm going to adjust that. And I might as well also put in my format short G because apparently I forgot to do those. Okay, so this will be single spaced in the future. Continuing on down, use the find function to locate all the positions where 100 occurs in the following random vector. Display your results, then use length to determine how many total values there are. Now it's going to be random, so we may get different results. So first of all, I want to know where the hundreds are. So I'm going to name my variable indexes and set it equal to find where in vector there's a match for 100. And then how many of those values are there? That would be the length of indexes. So let's run the code here. So it looks like 100 appeared three times at position 92, 333, and 490. How many times? There it is right there from the length function. 490 should be pretty close to the end. It should be 10 off of the end because this is saying we want values between 1 and 100 inclusive, 500 rows, one column. So if I just scroll up a little bit here, there's that 100, 10 from the end at position 490 right there. Perfect. And I could go up and look for these, but I'm just going to trust that they're there. You will get different results because it's random. Let me rerun it. And there, I just happened to get three again, but uh, if I run it again, there we go. Now I got seven of them, whole bunch. All right, it's, it's very random. I'm getting three a whole bunch, but you know, you see it's all over the place. Continuing on down. All right, more with indexes here. And this is also related to code that I showed in one of the videos. It's just so important to practice and be able to do yourself. So hopefully you've already attempted this as you're watching this uh, solutions video. So I've got two vectors right here. I'm just providing this code. I'm going to use the max function to determine what is the maximum value in the vector v and in which column does it occur. And then I'm going to plug that which column variable into the parentheses of the x vector to determine what is the corresponding value in x. And I'll put it into this variable here. Or you can do it all in one step. So now here's the same thing, but not quite with the minimum. And I only say it's not quite the same thing because there's two uh, equivalent minimum values. So this right here is actually going to get both of them, whereas this technique right here is only going to identify the first one. Continuing on down here, but now I want you, or I'm going to show you how I would do it, to use either of the previous techniques, uh, the previous indexing techniques, to find the value in buddies at the same position as the maximum value, the largest value in the vector named original. There is going to be randomness involved. All right, so originals here is going to be a matrix of random integers between 1 and 10, one row, eight columns. And buddies is going to be a random vector, in this case, or matrix, of floating point values between 0 and 1, values with decimal places, not integers, one row and eight columns. I'm going to display them out transposed, by the way, to make them a little easier to read. All right, but I want to identify what's the maximum in originals and what's the corresponding value in buddies. So the way I might do that, I'm going to use shorter variable names this time. So M for max and then uh, POS for position. I'm not going to use I for index because I is the imaginary number. And then I'll say equals the max in originals. And then in buddies, I'm looking for buddies at position POS, position. Again, another way you could have done that is buddies parentheses where originals is equivalent to the maximum 
of originals. Resize and then run it. Uh, I typoed something here on line 126. Buddy's originals equals max original. I missed the S right there. Okay, let's try it again. All right, great. So here's my eight random originals. Here's my eight random buddies. The largest value in originals is easy to identify. It's right there. It's one, two, three, four, five, position six. And so, yeah, so the maximum is 10. It's at position six. And the corresponding value in the other vector is 0 0.07, uh, or either way we want to calculate it. So is that true? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, it is. It is random. If I run it again, I get different results. Now it's still 10, but now it's at position two, and we get different results down here. And oh, look, the second technique, this one with the double equal sign, identifies that there are two different values that match the maximum. So the 10 must appear twice. Scrolling up, we see, aha, there it is. So the second and third value. So these are the two corresponding values, 0.67 and 0.95, and we see them output right there. All right, and that is the end of the exercise.